Well, good evening, everybody. Uh, my name is Mitch Weisberg, and I'm here with EdChat Interactive. And I'll be doing the introduction and then uh, bringing up um, the, the main speakers for tonight, Steve, Lisa, and Mark. And tonight's session is going to be on virtual reality in the classroom. Um, <clears throat> so it should be interesting because uh, all three of them are doing really cool things with virtual reality. And obviously, the, the kids love it. Uh, they love it. And it's a way of really injecting a lot of energy into the classroom. Now, without further ado, let me bring up Lisa. Hi, everyone. Lisa. Hi. How are you? I'm good. How are you? Good, good. So um, what's Foundry 10? So Foundry 10 is an educational research organization, um, but we're a little bit unique in the sense that we also design programs and projects that we put in schools and we work in collaboration with schools as well as bringing kind of the research piece. So we're a team of people from a whole bunch of different backgrounds looking at things ranging from the arts all the way through um, technology with preschool through college age uh, students. So we're really looking at kind of non-traditional forms of learning, so people who are trying to bring interesting things into educational environments, and a lot of our work focuses on student creativity. So you're a firm believer that every student should get worksheets every night for homework? <laughs> Definitely no. <laughs> Definitely no? Yeah. Oh my gosh, you just crushed my whole world. So so what? what's your attitude towards homework? Does homework work, or does homework actually get in the way of learning? Um, I think it really depends on the objective that you're trying to achieve. I think that there are times where homework can really be a great extension and chance to kind of delve into some things that um, kids are really interested in because I've, I've done some neat projects with kids where that was the case. I'm a former classroom teacher. I have a master's mm -hmm. in education and I taught for, for 10 years. But I think that um, there are times where people give homework just for the sole purpose of giving homework and I, and I feel like that kind of misses, misses yep. the boat. Yeah. Well, the same the same thing for schoolwork. I mean, the worst thing is to have somebody who actually finishes the work early and to get and for their reward, they get another worksheet. I know, yes, <laughs> definitely, definitely. Yeah. yeah. So, so, but but allowing them to do a little VR now that might be a, a great reward. Yes. And and so is virtual reality something that's just should be used as a reward for good behavior or good work, or can yeah. kids actually learn from it? We are big advocates of putting things in front of kids that we think are really going to expand how they think and that it shouldn't be the, the golden carrot that you're, you're holding out there, but that in fact it could be something that helps engage a student or opens up a whole new ar arena of questions to explore that they otherwise might not have even thought of. So we are huge advocates of letting all sorts of students try VR and not holding it off to only you know, the, the select few who maybe finished all the worksheets in order to get there. Yes. Well, and do you think that Mark Suter might have something interesting to say also? I do indeed. So okay. can I just say, so part of what Foundry 10 has done is we've done a couple of studies looking at virtual reality in educational settings. And so Mark and Steve were actually teachers that we'd worked with on other work with uh, video games and technology. And they were part of our study this last year to look at what it even looks like to implement VR in educational settings. And they are also going to be part of our study next year looking more at virtual reality content in classrooms. So yes, both wow. of them have extremely interesting things to say. OK, so why don't I get out of the way and get one of the more interesting people up here? I, and I think the next person should be Mark, right? Yeah, that works fine. Or should be Steve. OK, all right, here we go. Hi, Mark. Hello. Hi, Lisa. So just a quick, as a quick intro, so Mark works with high school level students. And part of what was really interesting about Mark's work is that Mark's students tend to focus a little bit more on content creation versus content consumption with virtual reality. Um, so, you know, Mark, why don't you maybe just paint a picture because your, your tech class setting was really unique to a lot of schools. So can you tell us a bit about it? Yeah, so I'm in a rural school in Ohio. We graduate maybe 40 kids or so. It's really small. Um, a lot of cornfields around us. So, um, but we we know there's content to be created around here, whether it's VR or 360 video. And it's interesting to see what farming is like in 360, believe it or not. Um, and so with VR, we've been I teach high school computer science and some sixth grade classes, so we work that into it too. But we're really interested in seeing it from the creation of the the programming. How are the the 
human machine interaction elements working together, the controllers, all of that. And so we do a lot of play and it's like really hard play. It's like play when you're in the sandbox and it's like right on the verge of, I don't think I can do this type of play. Yeah. And I that way all the time. And so I know the students are feeding off of that and they're like, Suter, what do we do? And I'm like, I don't know, let's it out. And so that's a lot of what the classroom environment is, is a lot of, you know, I don't know what's going on either most of the time, but between us, we can figure out the strategies on how to continue learning. Because no matter what field you're in, you are eternally going to be a student. Absolutely. Could you just talk briefly? I know one of the things that we were struck by when we did our, our study of your school was how you introduced the whole idea of content. So you had your students actually do some work, like kind of critically assessing content that existed before they actually dove into creation. So can you talk about that? Yeah, so there's the one device that everybody wants to get their hands on and be using. And the way that I structured it was everybody else could be doing really productive things and still researching things. So while the first one person would be testing an app or a game on the Oculus or the Vive or even the cardboard and the, the Gear VR, um, we had a Google spreadsheet and we had it set out or laid out so they had various metrics to measure the app on its usability, its audio, uh, the gameplay, all those types of video game um, evaluation things you would do and even then it's compatibility because we we're on a dk2 for the oculus and so we figured out quick what would work and what would likely crash and there's a lot, a lot of version changes in, it, in this type of stage um i say vr spreadsheets steve <laughs> google spreadsheets um and so all the kids had access to that and that was that was really productive because they all had their own little lineup of okay and they would they started setting timers like okay you get eight and a half minutes before the next kid goes i'm like hey that works for me they're taking <laughs> over this whole thing and running it once i train them how to do it and be careful with it and respectful and all that um, it was really neat to see them jump into hyper productivity mode. well and i think it's interesting too because you've worked with kids on developing games and website content and other other uh, forms of media but one of the things that we we noticed from our study was that you know, obviously creating content in VR and even exploring content in VR is very, very different. And so having the kids sort of critically look at, you know, did this, what, what worked well um, in the way the developers made this, what didn't work well, particularly in a tech-based class. And some of our humanities-based classes with teachers, they're looking at, you know, the accuracy of like a historical piece of content, but your class was looking at it from a very technical standpoint. Yeah. yeah. The, one of the things we looked at the most was what part of this can we replicate and how are we going to do that? So obviously not trying to bite off more than we can chew because it's, it's a high school computer science set of class. And But we know that we can make these interactions, collision interactions, scores and those types of things and picking out elements that we can do from each one and then assembling all of that into one larger game. Excellent. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I'm going to go ahead and ask you the first question, then we'll switch to Steve so that we don't have a weird, a weird, a weird rotation. But our first sort of official question was, could you just briefly touch on what the greatest challenges and the greatest successes that you had in using VR this past year? Um, so one of the things that I ran into was um, we, we got an Alienware laptop through a grant thing, and I thought, great, I'll be able to take this to conferences. And, such. and the problem was is how it switches from onboard graphics to other graphics card. And without, without getting too technical, just follow decks that are on the manufacturer's website, which is get the, the desktop and those types of things um, with the video cards. And the by the way, I, I saw in some of the forums, people are interested in what hardware to get. My recommendation is in June, get the NVIDIA uh, GTX 1070 or 1080 graphics cards, yeah. which if you just Google that, it'll um, uh, get you where you want to be. They're just coming out and they're not as expensive as the older high-end cards. but. Um, as far as challenges go, um, the hardware wasn't a huge one. It was really trying to structure it in a way that I have one device here beside me, and what do I do with the rest of these kids? And so I, I, we did the spreadsheet thing, and the other hybrid model we made was um, while they're creating their games and apps and stuff, a lot of times somebody would not even be using it. They would be creating in Unity, and then they'd say, hey, Mr. Suter, can I test this out on the, on the Oculus? be like yeah cool great that's what it's for um and so after they got the novelty wore off a little bit of just trying the vr and the wow and all that they're like cool we want to create stuff now and so we worked through that challenge by letting them create really 
Well, and one of the things that we learned from the study of the, the different teachers was that it's really important for the students to be able to iterate pretty quickly and to be able to, to work maybe in Unity or work in Unreal and then actually really, you know, export that, get to play it, um, and then bring it back to, to work on it some more. That kind of immediate feedback. We had a school that worked primarily with 360 video, and the same thing was true there, that they really needed to be able to, to, to get in there, look at their footage, and make adjustments right away, or that they lost interest yeah. over, over time. One other thing I failed to mention was, because we don't know what's going on, or we don't feel like there's a lot of YouTube videos and trainings out there on how to make VR content in Unity, because it's all brand new. All the people that know what they're doing are out there making their living doing it. <laughs> yes. so all the people that are like hobbyists like me are going to have to create that content. But teaching the students that resourcefulness of, OK, there aren't trainings out there. What are you going to do now? Are we just going to, well, we'll just let it collect dust over here. Or we learn how to use forums properly. We scour all the manufacturers' website forums, and there is stuff out there. You just it doesn't always show up in a Google search. There's other ways to find information. Yeah, great. Thanks, Mark. Um, so Mitch, I think we'll let Steve come up for a few minutes here and talk a little bit about his class. So one of the other things that was interesting for us doing the study was we had high school students, we had middle school students, and um, there there are really differences in the ways that those students seem to conceptualize of virtual reality. Um, this year we actually do are doing some things with elementary school as well, although I think there are some interesting sort of ethical issues that come up when you start to bring, especially the advanced headsets, to the younger kids because their ability to sort of differentiate between reality and virtual reality is a little bit more murky. But Steve works with middle school students and had a lot of success um, uh, having students create and explore content at middle school. So Steve, would you introduce your group and yourself? Sure. Um, so my name is Steve Isaacs. Uh, I teach video game design and development at William Annan Middle School in, in Basking Ridge, New Jersey. So um, right off the bat, it's kind of a unique class. Um, and when it came to the opportunity to work with VR, I was uh, very excited at what, what might come of that in terms of, um, you know, like Mark was talking about, content creation as we move forward. Uh, that's definitely a big goal. Um, so this year, though, it's interesting. I mean, we we learned a lot, um, <laughs> and some of it we learned because we did actual research on virtual reality, um, and and that sort of happened a little accidentally. Um, we started curating articles through a site called Declara, which I'm happy to share with everybody the uh, the curated list of resources that the kids came up with. And part of that process was commenting on you know on these these articles about VR and, and the kids in turn ended up learning much more than I think I even intended in terms of the differences in, in hardware and things like that. Um, but of course the the real joy and excitement was in the the experiencing VR with both uh, the Oculus Rift and the HTC Vive, which we had for a few weeks. Um, and you know we're working very much toward the 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 goal of of creating content and as new resources and, and tools come out for uh, for VR. And it's interesting to watch because um, one of the things, and I'll talk about it a little later, called um, No Limits Coaster is something the kids have been using. And it, the actual VR component is something that often with the, with a lot of this software is in sort of a almost perpetual beta, where what they'll do is they'll throw it out there, and then they'll have to refine the software. So they'll pull it back for a while. So um, certain tools are becoming available and, and such at, at, you know, at different times and, and we're, you know, really right in there with, um, with, you know, testing them, you know, as they're coming out. So that's been an interesting process and, uh, you know, I'll be able to talk a little more to that. Yeah, and actually, and I just want to kind of pivot off that just a little because one of the things that we found as well was that there isn't a ton of content yet in every single area. And so the teachers that were involved in the, the study often found really interesting ways to integrate content and connect ideas from content. You know, we had a school in Toronto where they used um, Keep Talking um, and No One Explodes, uh -huh. and they used it as a communication exercise because they used it with students that were actually having some troubles with um, oral and written communication skills. And so one person puts on the headset, the Oculus, and they see a bomb, and they're trying to communicate to a group of students that can't see the bomb but has a whole like workbook of things that you can they can use to disarm the bomb so someone's saying I see a red wire I see a yellow wire and someone else is looking through the, the you know the book trying to figure out okay well if, if you're looking at this you need to do that and so there were really creative ways to kind of use 
content. And I know you you're, you talked specifically also about how sometimes that content enabled particular students that maybe weren't resonating as well with sort of the technology class to really engage. So can you maybe talk about some of the examples of that? Yeah, yeah, and, and I'll, I'll go back to that uh, No Limits coaster. Really interestingly, um, there's a kid that, <laughs> you know, I didn't really even know him too well, you know, at the beginning of the course, and, and it's going on, and he's a quiet kid, so, you know, it's it's often easy with the quiet kids to let them, you know, they, they're they great, they don't, you know, they, they kind of work quietly and such, and then all of a sudden, um, he, when he realized that we could, I was talking about how No Limits Coaster was available for virtual reality for the Oculus, and he had commented that he has the, you know, the software at home and has played around with it. So I, um, I got the software for, for school, and, um, you know, my kids do a lot of like 20% time uh, type of activities. So he immediately, when I said that he could use that for his 20% time, you know, gravitated towards that. So one of the especially cool things about that was that here it is something he's interested in at home, you know, already demonstrating expertise in, and he could come in and bring that to school. Um, the coolest thing, however, was that as much as he enjoyed this, and it's like a, if you, I, you know, I don't know if anybody knows the, the software, or the game, but it's, um, it's almost, it's kind of like a CAD, you know, computer aid design software for building roller coasters. Um, so it's fairly sophisticated in terms of, you know, the physics and things related to roller coasters. Um, you know, you can, you know, build up the, the, the actual amusement park and all sorts of things. And of course, you know, ride the coasters. Um, when this kid first rode one of the coasters he built with the Oculus goggles on, it was like a life-changing moment for him, I, I would like to say. Um, and then it became really cool because he started bringing in all his friends during lunch because he wanted them to, you know, ride the coaster that he built. And, and you know, he built the coaster and then realized that it was cool, but, you know, there stood to be more like um, trees and things and an environment around the roller coaster. So he he went to town building that up. And and then what he discovered is that you can um, walk around the amusement parks in VR and walk up to existing rides and stuff. So now he's building, you know, an entire amusement park. Um, but this kid's been so engaged. Um, another thing I'll share in the chat in a few minutes is the blog posts that he has written um, and this kid, he wasn't, you know, I have my kids reflect on all of their submissions for work and he was fine with that. But when, when I kind of really got him interested, you know, or, you know, in, in what he was doing with this, you know, it, it became a different story for how he was willing to share what he was doing and share it with an authentic audience, you know, through his blog and everything. So that was super exciting and it continues to be. And now any day that he's able to, you know, he'll go right to the, to that computer and he's hard at work um, unless somebody, you know, kicks him out of the chair and needs to use the headset. And I know we want to leave time to obviously do questions and break into small groups, but before we do that, I'd like to ask both you and Mark um, to, to talk about you. Now you've both had about a year under your belt of really using VR and trying different things in the classroom and, and many teachers and educators haven't even had a chance to do that. So knowing what you know now and having had that experience, um, is there anything in particular you think is really worthwhile to, to share about, hey, if you're if you're thinking about doing VR or you're thinking about some logistical issues or, or content or anything, anything that you uh, maybe wish you had known that now that you've got it under your belt, you you know now? Yeah, I mean, I'll, sure. So, I mean, there's a lot of, you know, your typical, you know, kind of troubleshooting kind of things that I think, um, you know, now that we're getting over that hump a little bit, um, you know, that that's certainly a good thing. Um, in terms of, you know, Mark had mentioned the idea of um, how to manage, you know, the use of like, it brings us back, it's funny, we used to live in this world where you had one computer in a classroom, so you had to figure out how to teach with one computer in a classroom. So right now I have one Oculus Rift in the classroom, so it, it, how do you do that? So, um, you know, it, one of the things I think I would, would move into right away for next year is um, a little more in terms of, I have my kids... Um, so far, it's been a lot of exploration and a lot of them learning what they've wanted. So I had some kids starting to learn a little bit of Unity and doing things and and other products and things. Um, next year, I'll definitely will do some more um, guided, you know, maybe have some more of the kids do, like Unity has some great tutorials that you could run through or, 
you know, or I would do, you know, demos with the whole group and then give them all, you know, maybe bite size um, activities to complete. Um, this year, I think I was thinking broader, like the kids that would really latch on to it would um, would just go to town. And there were a few, but um, but in order to make it more accessible to more kids, I think that would be one thing. And then again, managing it, um, you know, ideally, I think it'll be neat if we get to a point where we have, a, you know, a configuration of VR where kids can be working, developing on one, you know, or several computers and then have several you know, devices to test out on, but um, but the tech specifications are going to dictate a lot of that. So, I mean, some of the software even they're using to develop is going to require higher end equipment and then to test it, obviously, they're going to need that as well. So I think as we move forward, you know, figuring out how to best outfit uh, an environment to allow for that and where in a school that would, would reside, and that kind of thing. But I, I think um, it'll be really exciting to go those next steps and, 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 you know, explore that. Great. Thanks. Um, so Mitch, if we could bring Mark up so he could answer a similar question. I can say one thing we learned from the study that was actually a little bit surprising was even VR content that we considered relatively innocuous. Um, you know, there's a Vive demo called the Blue Experience and you're on a shipwrecked ship and it's actually very peaceful for most people. And this blue whale comes by and you get this sense of scale um, was scary to some people, adults as well as kids. And so I think one thing that we learned was that, you know, it's, it's a pretty intense experience for people to be immersed in an environment. And so in terms of scaffolding and kind of preparing people for what they're actually going to experience, even things that we were like, hey, this isn't a big deal, um, were intense. So then when you start to look at you know, some of the Syrian refugee simulations or the 9-11 simulation, like things that can have very strong visceral responses, um, we really need to be cautious about how we introduce kids to that content and making sure we take the time to debrief and discuss because um, it can be it can be very, um, it can be very strong and very intense. And um, one of the great pieces of software that we found was a good introductory thing for students was um, Tilt Brush on the Vi, which is a painting, um, uh, just a real low key, but you get to do 3D artwork. And it was a great chance for students to kind of control that experience, get used to VR, nothing was flying at them, and just to kind of set that baseline. Um, so that was just something that we had learned. But, you know, Mark, how about you? What what would you want to kind of share? That you, uh, you mentioned the tilt brush. I, I'm making a note to everyone and myself. I want to post a link to a YouTube video of one of the tilt brush things that I made at the end of the school year. I'll show it so people can go see what that looks like. Um, I also jotted a couple of notes you asked asked about what I wish I would have known before. Um, number one would be definitely uh, learning how to collaborate with the students on where the direction of the VR is going to go. It's such a novel alpha first mover stage right now, and that novelty will wear off. Volunteer, take advantage of it. And rather than coerce them into something I've thought up over the summer and say, you know what, this is what we're going to do. These are my learning objectives. And I keep it somewhat loose, which can be um, a little scary to some teachers because they like to really have a lot of control, but I like to hand a lot of that control right over to the student and say, here's all the cool things that kids have done in the past, this past year, this was made, these are the tutorials say, but what do you guys want to make with this? Where, where do you want to take this? Here's, and I, I'm very upfront with them about, I'm a computer science teacher, I'm accountable for these things. You have to help me out on that. We have to meet these objectives together. And once I'm very, excuse me, very upfront and very real about that, they open up a whole new slew of ideas um, and just involving the student and all that. And the other thing I learned was how important trust is when it comes to immersion in VR. Yeah. Because yes. we have my 15 by 15 foot area here that we had the Vive and then they would sit at this computer for the Oculus. But once they put that headset on, they're to truly be immersed, they're trusting that the people around them are not going to be messing with them. Um, yes. They're not like poking fun at them physically or just like laughing and stuff like that. Um, and occasionally that does still happen, but it's kids that have never experienced it yet. And once they put yes. it on, they're, they're like, oh, okay. Yeah, I'm not going to with them anymore. And I'm very strict about just that portion because it breaks the immersion. In fact, when it I'm does. all it breaks alone, the yeah. yeah, when I'm all alone, like after school, I'd be tilt brushing and <clears throat> feel more um, anxious, like I feel like somebody may have just walked in and I was more nervous then than if there was a room full of students watching me because I have a trust with them. 
and I know that they're just taking it all in and watching what I'm seeing and that kind of thing. And I felt more at yeah. ease and I could let myself go more in those situations. So I think it would be my advice to those our teachers. Yeah, yeah. No, that is important to kind of establish those boundaries in that virtual space and, yeah. and set those rules and expectations for what that looks like. Absolutely. Yeah, um, so, Mitch, I don't know if anybody has posed any questions that um, you'd want to bring certain people up to the stage to, to answer or not. Um. So this would, yeah, this would be a good time. Nobody has actually posted a question to me, and I am the one person in this whole group here who can't see the IM. So if they put a question in the IM, I haven't seen it. But if you do have a question, uh, please raise your hand. But in the meantime, I'm going to ask a question, which you know you could answer or you could pull up, uh, Steve or Mark. But you know we have these. Um, well, this is the New York Times version, but it's the basically Google Glass. And you, you guys have been talking about um, Oculus Rift and some of the other goggles. But, uh, you know, other than the fact that I haven't figured out how to charge this so that it works. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, but, um, you know, but it, it, it's cool. And it is, you know, you, you do get the three-dimension experience. And you do get to walk around and, and the, the environment. Are, are teachers starting to use Google Glasses as, as a low-cost way of introducing? Yeah, we, we actually had a school that was involved, it was a middle school, and it was a history class, and the teacher there really wanted all of the students to be able to experience virtual reality at the same time, and the only way he could do that was with Google Cardboard, and even then, there were technical issues with students' phones, but we uh, he was able to overcome most of those. What we found, though, is that when you're using the Google Cardboard, or even like the Gear VR, um, and then if they ever get the chance to see the Vive or the, the new Oculus, what that does is kind of make those experiences seem very obsolete. And so they're great for like the elementary level classes because those, those age students aren't really supposed to use the fancy headsets. And I think like Mark alluded to, you know, there's times where students would rotate through and maybe work on the old DK2 Oculus. Um, but the once they've experienced something like um, the Vive, that's quite a step back to go into Google Cardboard because the Vive, you can actually interact with things um, in your environment. And, and I don't know if Mark or Steve wants to add anything to that. I don't know how to tell if anything. Well, but, well but yeah. they, could, they should uh, click on the raise hand button. But also, you know, other people who have questions, you should either um, put them into the IM, hopefully you have the IM open, or click on that ask button, in which case I can pass them around. Or even better, if you have a question that you want to ask directly, um, or comments, experiences that, that you have, uh, you know, uh, click on that that uh, that hand button so that I can see you and I, I can bring you up. Um, but I, I guess while while we're talking, the, these were two of the teachers, you know, Steve and Mark were two of the teachers that you've done research with in, in VR. Uh, what are some of the other things that you've seen from other classes? Um, you know, it, it was it was really interesting to look at kind of the different things people wanted to experiment with. So, like I said, we had a school in Hawaii that um, their whole focus was on 360 video. And what was surprising was that the kids really got the hang of doing 360 video. They even got the hang of using the, the stitching software because they actually did it where they set up um, six different GoPros on one rig. And then they used that versus just using like a Rico Theta, like 360 um, kind of handheld camera, and they used this very advanced software, and middle school students were able to stitch it. Um, but what became an interesting challenge was trying to figure the the best part of a, a film to capture in VR, because I think people get the sense that like, oh, I'll just you know film um, the pumpkin patch near my house, and that's going to be an interesting VR experience. And that's once you look around, that's really not. And so having students start to brainstorm, you know, what is the compelling piece here? what is interesting to capture in 360 video and how do we kind of logistically do that, propose some really interesting problem solving things, as well as using software like After Effects, even though students were able to use the, the stitching software well, After Effects was difficult. And so kind of navigating that, as well as we saw in many of the schools that students would take on different roles um, as student experts. So sometimes they would be technical experts, sometimes they would be content, people, sometimes they were the person that was going to troubleshoot um, or, you know, introduce outside students to content. And it was neat to kind of see how in every setting, students kind of gravitated towards different parts. And um, most of the teachers in the study were pretty flexible in the way that they approached their teaching. And so it was it was nice for students to kind of find that 
that area that was most intriguing to them. Some kids just wanted to figure out how VR worked, period. Um, so, mm -hmm. so that was neat to, neat to explore as well. Okay. And then, well, do you have a question that you want people to go into small groups to do, or do you want to pull up Steve yeah. or Mark? Yeah, we, no. we did come up with some some small group um, questions, um, and, and we were we were kind of interested to hear what kind of excited folks about uh, virtual reality and education, and so maybe breaking into small groups so that we could kind of chat with people about that would be a good. Okay. Next. All right. Well, you know, the other thing is, let me um, let me pull up Steve and Mark, and let's have them go at each other. Okay, because <laughs> I think I think we're ready for a fight. Of you know, I think Steve believes that. The, that VR is perfect for middle school and should never be used in high school. Oh. <laughs> okay, and let's see what, what, what Mark says about that. So I'll pull myself down and I'll pull Steve up and then, and then bring you down and, and pull Mark up. Sounds great. Okay. Hello. Before Mark gets up here, I'll say a few things about Mark. Um, actually, I don't think Mark and I have ever disagreed about anything in our in in the time we've known each other. Um, what we did want to do is we wanted to pose a few questions to the group um, and allow people to have the opportunity to get in small groups. I'm trying to think how many people we have here. Looks like we have about. Um, I think if people get in groups of about four people, um, you'll be able to talk as a small group um, and or actually even a group of three maybe and then you know and, and Lisa Mark and I'll join groups to make some of them four and Mitch will do the same um, but anyway we wanted to pose a couple of questions for you to ponder so I don't know if you want to throw out the first one there Mark sure if you uh, have it I handy it was, <laughs> I heard in the chat room earlier but just what are people really excited about using VR for um, and while you're thinking about that, I know this platform is new to a lot of people. And so I was doing one for the first time a few weeks ago. And it kind of is kind of nerve wracking to me to be like, OK, I'm going to be up on stage and everyone's going to be watching me. And the fact that everybody can see each other be kind of nerve wracking to some people. But uh, raise your hand. We'd love to hear from you guys um, and, and, and make it an interactive and I think chat. Yeah, and as we as we break to the question, in other words, Mark's question was, what what are you most excited about in terms of bringing uh, VR to education? What you can do, if I understand the system right, is you can click on people down below, and you'll actually become a small group of three to talk about this, and then we'll come back as a big group at some point. Mark and I will, or Mitch will pull us back up, or however he magically does that. Um, but for the time being, grab a group of you know, kind of connect with two other people. And start talking about you know what you're excited about in terms of VR, and we'll come down and join some groups as well. So the worst part about this interaction is that at some point it ends, uh, and I think I'm going to bring Lisa back up. I see she's involved in a discussion, but um, I'm going to disrupt that a little bit, and let me bring Lisa back up. Okay, so I'm sorry to break your break up the, the discussion, but what were you guys talking about? So actually, interestingly, we were talking about virtual reality with younger children, and I was talking about some of the research that's been done. Um, and you know, aside from sort of like the the eye strain or maybe their eyes not even aligning well with headsets, there are some interesting issues with um, younger kids being able to differentiate the virtual world from the real world. And I was telling them there's a, a lab out of Stanford that's done a lot of work with virtual reality. And I was just reading a paper that they had done looking at like preschool and elementary age students and some of the confusion that those kids experienced um, whether or not VR was, was real. And, and interestingly, in our study with student responses, we've seen some interesting things where kids reference VR like a form of time travel, <laughs> um, particularly younger younger kids. And so I think um, in addition to sort of just the some of the physical things, there's just some interesting questions around um, younger kids' ability to, to differentiate that, hey, I got to visit, you know, the big whale underwater, but that's that's not a real whale and I wasn't I wasn't really there. And I think one of the great things about the Google Cardboard is that, you know, it, it kind of clearly, I think, helps differentiate that a little bit more than some of the more advanced headsets for, for, for those younger students. Um, and so they get the sense of getting to see a place, um, but kind of know that we weren't actually um, in that place. But there's not a ton of, 
there's not a ton of research yet. And I know in my room there were some people doing research, and there's a really interesting paper on kind of the, the ethics of looking at virtual reality and research. And they bring up some really great questions um, that are very specific to VR versus other forms of media. So um, if you search VR ethics paper, um, you can it's a free paper. So I would recommend that as well. And can you put the uh, URL of that paper into the chat room? Do you think? Yeah, yeah, I just need to find, find the paper so we're not on stage. <laughs> okay, okay. So I think what I'm going to do, uh, well, actually, Steve su suggested that he has a couple of his students, although, um, yeah, Mark Suter just raised his hand also. But I, th I was thinking maybe I'll bring Steve up and he can talk to his students about what they've done using, vir using VR. Do you think that would be okay? Yeah, okay. And I'll put the URL in. Okay, good. Okay, Steve. So, so you actually you have some real life students. I do, I do, I do. And okay. they're here. And and, and, and you know, like usually in education, I and mean, we tell the kids what to do. They're going to be telling us what 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 to do this time. I think that's cool. Yes, absolutely. So, who sh yes. who should I bring up? Um, well, let's bring up. Uh, why don't you bring up Vikram um, first, uh, otherwise known as Vikrorius? And then, uh, okay. and then maybe Mia would come up as well afterwards. Hi, so everyone. Vikram, how you doing? Good. You good? So uh, a couple of things I'll, I'll share real quick about Vikram, and then I'll let him take over. But uh, last year, um, we happened to have had a virtual reality hackathon, um, not at our school. It was at the Bergen Makerspace, and. Vikram, uh, who was in, who was a seventh grader then, not involved in this VR stuff at all yet, uh, was able to attend that event, and then he's been in my class this whole semester. So I would just love for everybody to hear, you know, myself included, you know, his take on on VR from both of those experiences. Yeah. So at the VR hackathon last year, I got to try out for the first time the Oculus Rift. And um, that was a really cool experience back then, considering it was my first experience with virtual reality. And then uh, throughout the semester this year, uh, at first we had the HTC Vive for a couple of weeks, and that was really immersive, and also the Oculus Rift, which was pretty good as well. Um, I think the biggest next step that virtual reality has to take is engaging the rest of the senses. So right now, we have a near complete immersion in our hearing and seeing senses, but we still have to get smell, taste, and touchdown. And there are a couple technologies like the Tesla suit out there developing uh, to get that down right now. But I think that's the big next step because when we get all five senses, then it's like we're in a different world. And the uh, that Tesla suit you found information yeah. on when we were doing the research with Clara, right? Yeah. I'll share that group. That's cool. That's awesome, Vikram. Thank you. And um, let me bring up Mia as well for a second, just to hear her her experiences. Hello, Mia. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> so, what what can you share just about you know the experience having VR in our class and such? Um, well, the first time that I ever put like on the headset, and it was actually Fruit Ninja was the game that was pulled up. Um, right now, I felt like my heart got very nervous to say in a way because I've never done this before. I've just seen people do it, but um, my heart started racing a little bit. And when I got in, that like it was like like almost like you're saying about time travel, it was, like jumping to a whole new world. It was just it was beyond what I thought I was when I saw other people do it. It was just an amazing experience. That that's really in, an interesting take because um, I mean I remember it. It's funny how how big of an impact I think Fruit Ninja had on both teachers and students. It was like for some reason that was like the one of the coolest experiences people had. And I was actually talking with with Lisa earlier today about things like that. And and what I was saying, and tell me if this experience happened for you, Mia. And it, it, the way you were describing it, you were saying, you know, you were a little nervous and things. What I found with the Fruit Ninja thing is all of a sudden people were like this ninja and we're just like having a great time flailing about like not worrying what it looked like or who was looking um did you find that you got 
immersed to a degree that you kind of let go of that? Oh, definitely, because yeah. I've played that game when I was younger, and now seeing it actually in well, reality, it was amazing to me because I just remember moving my hand across the screen, and now I was actually holding the sword, cutting it, and I thought like right. from that, from jumping from just playing on the iPad to actually be able to be doing it, it just it blew my mind. <laughs> That that's super cool, and I think that that speaks so well to the um to that experience of that immersion when we've had it, and especially it seems to me, and and you expressed it, and so did Vikram, that the the Vive having and and I like what Vikram said too about the senses. I mean, the Vive getting your whole body involved is such a different experience from the Oculus. Like, have you, Mia, have you done much yet with the Oculus? Um, no. I've just okay. I've seen people do some things miraculous, and I know a good amount of what it is. So. Right. Okay. No, that's cool. But I definitely relate to what you're saying about the uh, the the vibe. So thank you both. Um, I know we have um, another couple of questions. So why don't we throw another question at the group um, and let you get back in small groups and talk about because that that's a big uh, part of what we'd like everybody to be able to experience. Yeah, so. so the the second question, Steve, is what steps can you take to bring VR to your school? So really trying to think of those action steps. Um, and I know in the small group conversation I was earlier, um, some people were talking about, like, in even the chat room, the cost factor being an issue for adoption. And that's definitely an issue because especially with the PC you got to buy and then the hardware. And so I would love to hear ideas on ways you could even develop for, like, cardboard. Board, and I know there's some new devices that will be out that will be somewhat lower end um, devices, but like Jonathan was saying, maybe over immersion is a potential worry. So you don't always have to have the super high end stuff. Um, so what action steps could you take to bring VR to your school or your classroom? So we're, uh, we're, we're getting close to 9 o'clock Eastern, so let me bring Lisa up. We'll probably run a few minutes over tonight, but find out from Lisa. So what, what was your group talking about? Did you come up with some ways? Well, one of the interesting things that we, we, we talked about donors choose as a way to get some equipment into, into schools. Um, obviously, like my organization has put equipment into schools, um, but one of the interesting turns our conversation took was um, some of the students in the group were talking about whether or not they actually feel that virtual reality is really going to be useful in education. And I think that's definitely part of why we're doing the work that we're doing is, um, you know, is, mm -hmm. besides being something that people are excited about, is there is there educational value? And, and like I, I mentioned at the beginning, our current study this coming 2016, 2017 school year involves about 16 schools um, across North America and looking more at actual like content, um, the, the immersive quality of that content um, and perspective. Because I think one of the things we heard over and over again from teachers and students was, this will be this great medium for me to step into someone else's shoes. Um, and we didn't ask a lot of questions yet about did that really happen or, or what was that like? But I think that those are some of the important questions because mm -hmm. there's been many forms of technology that people got excited about that didn't do what we thought it would do. And that's that's part of what we're trying to delve into. So I thought it was great that the students brought that up. Okay. And then why don't I bring up, why don't I try to find uh, Steve or Mark? Um, that's, ah, I found Mark. So I'll bring up Mark and maybe he can, maybe the two of you can talk about some of the things that his group brought up. I'm sorry, Mrs. Castaneda, I wasn't paying attention. Yeah, no, it's fine. You know, we were talking about ways to make VR more accessible. And, and just one other note, um, we're working with a couple schools next year that really, they're using more of like a, um, like a magnet teacher approach. So maybe one teacher has VR in their classroom and that teacher works to bring other students and teachers into the, the classroom to experience different things to kind of augment learning. So we're exploring that model as well, because right, not everybody's going to have even Google Cardboards um, in, in their classroom. Um, and it's, it's, uh, it's a can be a tough thing to kind of actually access. So do you have any thoughts, Mark, on kind of that access point for teachers in terms of setup? Uh, and in our, in our small group, we're talking a little bit about, you know, the price points and that. And uh, one of the angles that I'm approaching, I'm actually leaving this current school and starting in a brand new school in the fall. 
and trying to think of, okay, where, where do I start? What do I do? And one of the things that I'm going to approach is with the students say, hey, we got this great angle, a new up and coming uh, element uh, in VR, a whole new field. Why don't we go start approaching uh, administrators from that angle of we could get some good PR for our school even and really yeah. turning them into little salespeople. Um, but, and, and then knowing how to collaborate with other teachers because we want to try and publish some stuff. So we need to get with the English department and say, hey, can you teach us or have you, and better yet, have your kids teach us how to do APA formatting in a published document. Um, I don't know if that answered the question or not, but. No, it did. And I'm just kind of monitoring the talking and, and somebody was coming, there just isn't a lot of content yet. And one thing I do have to say is that the amount of content that's been generated in this last year that's come out has been substantially more than when we started with the groups. And I think that um, there is more and more content being produced. And, and again, a great access point for students is actually creating content. But yeah, there isn't, there isn't content for every single um, subject area, but I think it's an exciting time in terms of kind of getting to explore how people are thinking about VR. And um, I got to be at a conference where I heard Palmer Lucky talking about the Oculus Rift, and, and he was talking about that it's very important that we start thinking about VR as, as a really new medium um, in and of itself. And so, you know, if, if we're trying to approach it as just a moving diagram or creating content like we've always thought about content, we're really doing it a disservice because it's a very, very different, um, different medium. Um, so anyways, just wanted to kind of throw that and, throw that out there. But it looks like Steve also would like to come up. So maybe I can come down and while that's happening, I think maybe the three of us should put our Twitter handles down there because if there's first movers and educators and stuff and we're all looking for where do we collaborate together on these things and share resources. I know Steve, you shared something and there's your Twitter handle, uh, Mr. Isaacs, and I'm Garlic Suter. So um, we'll try to post where we're getting stuff and where we're putting stuff. Go ahead, Steve. And um, while, while, while we're doing that, uh, just, just one interesting thought and uh, idea that came out of our discussion, which um, was interesting to me, especially, is we were talking about, you know, in, in a lot of ways, Google Cardboard sounds like, um, and it could be, you know, it's it's a it's a good way to possibly enter the space. Um, however, my thought would typically have been, hey, if if we go with Google Cardboard, you have the option of uh, BYOD and allowing kids to bring their own devices. Um, you know, Jr. had brought up the the interesting point that. You have too much disparity between even those devices. So, um, and he had said in the chat that he was going to come up with recommendations for devices. I think we have to come to a point that if we're going to use it effectively in the classroom, there has to be sort of a common, um, you know, specification in terms of that tech in order for it to be effective. Uh, which is why I mean I love the idea that Google Expeditions, um, if it is in fact going to come out as a kit where, you know, you'll have a standard device with the uh, cardboard but of course that brings a different expense to the to the table so it's just interesting to think about all the possibilities of how to bring it in and and how high end do we go i know we struggled initially with the tech requirements for the computer we had the oculus but then if we weren't able to run it well based on that you know that was another question so so those are all great things to consider as we move forward um and uh, I'm excited. I mean, we had, a, I think my class it was just great for them to have the opportunity and continue to have the opportunity to explore and to figure, be sort of right in there, figuring some of it out, which kind of speaks a little to Enrique's point. Although there's not a whole lot of content or maybe we're fumbling through some of that, I think the kids being engaged in that part of the process is actually a really exciting, positive thing as well. So I don't want to discount that either it'll be great when there's immersive content for every subject area but i think having kids in that situation is 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 good so i think vikram might have something to say yeah um just to add to your point about uh the disparity between the devices i i see some companies are like battling this already i was just watching the google io 2016 uh yesterday and they were talking about their new vr platform uh, Daydream VR, and uh, they had talked about how, at least on Android for now, hoping this carries on to iOS um, soon, that how for all new Android phones that are made, they have like specific specifications that uh, Android phones have to pass, that test 
to in, call them VR ready. So I think like in the future, uh, whenever devices are made, they'll be made either with or without like that VR ready stamp, and then they should be able to work with any VR. Awesome. So, uh, as we're actually five minutes over, <laughs> so yeah, right. Um, so, do you have uh, a, a closing, some closing comments that you you'd like to make about VR, Steve? You know, again, like I'm just excited, kids, that that my students have this opportunity. Um, like you know, Mark had brought up also about content creation. I think if we can put this technology in kids' hands and give them the opportunity to develop, to develop for this content. I mean, these kids are so far ahead of, you know, <laughs> you know, they're up there in a sense with these developers. I mean, granted, they're, you know, working at a, at a rate, you know, and, and with, um, you know, a learning mm -hmm. curve and whatnot, but, but they have this great opportunity that I want to keep running with. So wait a minute. You say the kids are ahead of the. I thought we were the ones who were ahead of the running curve. You mean the kids are Don't leading us? yourself. Yes, and <laughs> and that's and it's awesome. And um, learning. And I know Mark. Mark would would share this same idea. Learning with and from our students, to me, makes my job absolutely awesome. Um, you know. Isn't that fun? It, it really is, isn't it? Absolutely. Cool. Okay, and I know Lisa wanted to say a few words also, so I'm going to bring her up now, and and here's Lisa. Hey. Hey. So yeah, I think that you know the the main reason that we even wanted to do a study was to really look at you know what what value might this have, and that's you know what we're hoping to kind of keep slogging through here as especially as more and more people try it. And I think that the questions that have come up in the chat are all really relevant and interesting questions, you know, that, um, you know, we have been able to work with certain developers to get content to try in schools and, and there are interesting ways to do it, but it, it is a time consuming thing for teachers and the learning curve um, can be, can be steep. But I think the potential that we've seen just in talking to students this year, we had about 400 students in this study um, and in looking at what the teachers are doing and the things that they're saying, that there really is neat potential in VR. And I think Steve's point that students oftentimes maybe even see it or conceptualize it, conceptualize of it in ways that we as adults can't or don't yet um, is an important piece. And so, you know, we'll continue to, to do our part with our research piece and we're gonna be sharing that research out. So um, our website's being redone at Foundry 10, but in the next couple months, if you look up, we'll have um, data that we found and things to share to hopefully help inform the process and, and kind of help the conversation in the larger educational community. And so, so people who are watching the, uh, you know, the, um, the archive aren't necessarily going to see the chat window. So can you just say the name of your website again? Because yeah. my guess is that if people wanted to find research, they could, they could go to your website and you have a lot of resources. Yes, and definitely. Um, so it's www.foundry10, the number 10, dot org. And, um, so, and my email is just lisa at foundry10.org. So if anybody um, has questions, and like I said, we also look into the research and things as well. So if you're looking for some research in a particular avenue or just have general questions, um, we, we are pretty well connected to some of those things. So I'd be happy to share. And you could, if educators are watching this, you could probably help them make the case for, for VR for their schools. Or we able to do it successfully in a number of districts. So hopefully we can help you out with that as well. So yes. Definitely. Okay. All right. Well, you know, thank you very much, and uh, thank uh, also Steve and Mark uh, for for coming on EdChat Interactive. And uh, I guess this is probably you know VR changes all the time. So my guess is that that we could do another session in the fall on virtual reality, and we'll be a lot a lot further advanced than, than we are today. Definitely. Definitely, it changes okay. very quickly. <laughs> yes, for better or for worse. Okay. For better or for worse. Okay. Well, Lisa, uh, thank you very much. And, um, you know, I'll see you online and probably at some conferences. And uh, this is Mitch Wolfberg, and I'm signing off for Chat Interactive. Thank you, everybody, for participating. Thank you especially to the uh, kids in Steve's class for coming on. You guys were great. Uh, you're the reason that we're here, because at some point, all of us are going to retire, and you guys are going to have to support us. So uh, thanks for coming on tonight, and thank you for being you. And hope to see all of you at a future EdChat Interactive. Our next one is on June 6th. So good night, everybody. <laughs>